Hi everyone, this is Matt Carwana here with Tim Forsman and Matt Lauder. This is the sixth episode of Bones and Stones, our weekly discussion group. Today, I think we have a, a pretty interesting topic. We're sort of chatting about questions that we often get asked as archeologists that are essentially misconceptions. So we're gonna, we've created a couple of questions. We're gonna tackle uh, each question in a, a separate episode. Today's question is dealing with um, sort of where is the world's most valuable archaeology actually found? When we think about archaeology um, in the popular media, we're, we're often sort of uh, attended to places like Egypt, China, South America that have wonderful uh, megalithic temples and, and so on and so forth. Um, but there are other parts of the world that are equally as rich and equally as important like Southern Africa. And so that's going to be our, our topic today. Uh, I'm going to hand the conversation over to Tim Forsman. Um, can you give us a brief rundown on your on your thoughts? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, it's a it's a really interesting question because there is fantastic archaeology in other parts of the world, but we definitely have amazing archaeology here. So um, people just don't know about it, and there's probably a whole range of reasons why. But just to, to sort of chat about a few of the sites that I think people may be familiar with, but people probably also don't know about, um, to start sort of in the more recent time, um, a site like Great Zimbabwe. Uh, I'm sure you guys have all heard of it. You've probably all been to it. It's an absolutely incredible um, site. It's the, it, it followed Mapungubwe in, in terms of chronology. Uh, it's a massive stone-built settlement uh, that dates from AD 1300 when the construction, the major part of the construction began. At the site, they found incredible archaeological remains, uh, soapstone birds, a long sequence of this development and increase in social complexity and state-level society, um, and a, a very unique site in, in the Southern African framework. Um, before Great Zimbabwe, if we come to South Africa, we've got Mapungubwe, also a phenomenal site, and it's believed to be the first state-level society in Southern Africa. And what I mean by that is a site where you had uh, kings uh, separated from his people, who was linked to, uh, had a divinity linked to him as well. He was directly linked to the ancestors. There was social stratification. There was the accumulation and curation of wealth, which included international trade wealth. Um, there was, the king had ritual control of the landscape. There was um, tribute stock that was coming into the capital. People were orientated around this Mapungubwe Hill. There's massive amounts of gold items that came out of graves there. So this is a really significant site. And it's a site right at the top of South Africa. People don't often get to see it. And on this landscape, there's a whole bunch of other sites that are incredible. Um, one, I mean, there's a lot of other Iron Age sites, uh, Molokwane, Tulamela, Kami, fantastic sites. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to talk about all of them, obviously. But in that area, there's also fantastic rock art. And that's a sequence that people are very unfamiliar with, uh, generally speaking. You have beautiful rock art there and in Zimbabwe. And if we come down to the Maluti Drakensberg, for example, that's probably our best known rock art sequence. And it's, it's remarkable. The site's uh, Game Pass Shelter is one of the most beautiful sites in the country. And it's a significant site as well in terms of it assisting us in understanding what this rock art actually means. Um, this artwork from the hunter-gatherers that spans the last few thousand years, definitely, but possibly much more than that, is the most incredible ancient art in the world. It's polychromatic, which means it fades from one color into another. Very few artists globally did that uh, when we're talking about this, this sort of archaeological artwork. It it's, depicts animals, people in various postures. It's generally a depiction of spirit world activities or shamanic experiences. Absolutely fascinating art sequence um, and provides us wonderful insights into the previous occupants of these landscapes. Um, and if we look at just not just their rock art, but we can also look at hunter-gatherer sequences in the ground. The last few thousand years, um, the later Stone Age, we have amazing sites along our coast, uh, that some, many of which can be visited. We have a lot of sites in the interior. Bushman Rock Shelter, for example, is one that's been excavated that people can go and see uh, near Urichstadt in um, Pumalanga. Um, that's one site that actually goes all the way into the middle Stone Age, I'll leave for lots to talk a bit about. Um, but these are sites that can be visited and viewed. Um, even in the Gauteng region, there's a number of sites that Rebel Mason looked at. You know, some of the ones we've visited ourselves in some of our trips too. There's a lot of really great later Stone Age sites that people can visit. Um, so there's certainly from that period, there's fantastic archaeology. And, and, a, and a point that Matt was, Lotto was making is that it's also everywhere. You know, it's, 
on your neighbors, on your piece of land, maybe if you have a farm or even in residential areas, you are, we often stumble upon archaeology. It's all over the place. Yeah, that's yeah. that's really um, really quite a, a concise um, uh, but but very important um, statement there. So, I mean, in your opinion, would you think that Southern Africa, when we're looking at the sort of like origins of of city states and, and sort of complex societies, actually Southern Africa is is one of the most important places to look at in terms of um, you know the formalization of of state level societies, uh, long distance trade networks. Would you would you agree with that? Yeah, it's certainly significant in terms of understanding these systems because with regard to the development of state level societies, there's this link with international trade. The trade along our, the East African coastline extended to about modern day Beira roughly um, because of the trade winds. And, from, and that's pretty much the most sub, southern point that it went. And from there, it entered the interior of South Africa and happened fairly quickly from when trade started to arrive. This trade led to the accumulation of wealth, which is one of the stimulus stimulants for state level society. So it's connected to this much larger global network of trade, economies, etc. So it's very significant from that perspective. Yes, state level societies developed early in other parts of the world, much early in some in some cases. But in, in this area, in that central part of Southern Africa, where, they, where there's Mapungubwe and Great Zimbabwe and other sites like Bambanjanalo and Schroeder and Mapela Hill and various others, this is a really critical area in terms of understanding local economic dynamics and how that filtered into these global systems, such as through ivory trade, uh, gold, rhino horn, uh, um, ostrich feathers, ostrich eggs, and, and things like that. Great. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Matt Lauder, can you give us some perspective on uh, the importance of, of Southern Africa and looking at the, the sort of older time periods? Uh, you and I are both earlier Stone Age archaeologists, and we know that this land is quite rich uh, with, with those types of finds. You maybe just touch upon some points you feel relevant. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, Southern Africa has an incredible uh, earlier Stone Age, Middle Stone Age, uh, or Stone Age record in general. Um, you know, often when I, you know, tell people that I'm an archaeologist, um, you know, the first thing they say to me is, right, well, Africa is definitely the, the place you want to be if you want to look at the Stone Age uh, studies, Paleolithic studies, and that's absolutely true. Um, you know, South Africa's got an incredible number of, of Stone Age sites, and obviously, um, you know, from an earlier Stone Age perspective, there's a lot of key sites within the Vol River Basin, for example, uh, sites like Canteen Kopi, uh, Vonnevar Cave, um, and we also have coastal sites as well, places like Ellensfontein. Um, Amanzi Springs is a very important one, very close to your heart. The sites that I excavated in the Sunday River, just in the next valley, uh, the better valley of the two. Um, I'm not going to step on any. I'm not going to step on anybody's toes here, Carrie. I'll leave Amanzi and the Cradle as well. The Cradle of Humankind, obviously, we all know about that. It's a very important uh, paleo landscape within um, South Africa. I'll, I'll leave that for you to discuss, given your given your current work there. But just to talk broadly, I mean, the reality is, is that these sites that we do have document millions of years worth of human development, human history, um, you know, from the assemblages which are preserved in these sites, we can look at very early subsistence uh, behaviors, looking at things like the um, early use of fire, uh, the use of organic material, which will speak to what you've been doing at Amanzi, for example, um, looking at subsistence habits where hunting starts to develop. A site like Katupan, for example, in the Northern Cape uh, has been an incredibly valuable site looking at the development of early hafted um, hunting technologies, uh, which is, which is um, you know, hotly debated, uh, but nonetheless, it's obviously a very informative site. Um, we can look at things like raw material sourcing, so where hominins were moving through the landscape, where they were sourcing actual rocks to make their stone tools. You know, essentially, um, stone tools were the Swiss Army knife of the past. You know, stone tools would have been used in a range of activities, uh, and these sites that we have, um, you know, provide a, a lot of evidence for the types of artifacts that would have been made for a range of different activities. Um, and, um, you know, from all of these sites, we can then put together a picture of what life would have been like in the past. We have the hominins, which are preserved as well within these deposits. So we can look at the different species along the lineage of, you know, the human development, which species are represented. Um, and we, we can then also, um, you know, look at, um, um, sorry, I'm just trying to have a look here. Um, lithic production techniques, essentially. So, you know, what kind of uh, strategies they were putting in place to manufacture their stone tools uh, and the different types of materials that were being used. So Southern Africa has a very detailed 
uh, Stone Age record. And, you know, if you look further up into Africa as well, if we look at key sites like Olduvai Gorge, for example, Oligasali, um, you know, that are within the, the East African Rift Valley. Um, they are also very uh, informative sites. And we can start to kind of put these broad trends together for Africa, looking at the hominin species that are represented and looking at overall trends that, are, that were happening during the, the, the earlier Stone Age. But obviously, you know, just bringing in some of your experience from the, the cradle and the Munzee Springs, I mean, obviously the cradle of humankind, very you know, informative, and you've obviously done lots of research there in the cradle. Yeah, so um, I, I'm, I'm speak specifically to the preservation of, of hominin remains um, in fossil preservation in general. So the Cradle of Humankind is obviously uh, sort of comprised of, of a number of cave systems. Um, the reason that we have such great preservation of, of um, hominins is, is because of the, the preservation conditions, the fossilization conditions within those cave systems. So if an organism dies, it happens to fall into a cave uh, and it's covered by sediment very quickly. You have a, a mummification process that happens because these caves are, are very cold and they're often places that are are sort of um, uh, not necessarily completely dry, but uh, th there's water inside of cave systems, um, but there are dry periods. And so when this happens, you have mummification, skin, and, and uh, sort of sinew holds bones together in articulation or in its correct anatomical position. And so when we then get the, the formation of, of hard breccia, uh, under these types of, of conditions, because we have a lot of lime inside of, um, of cave systems, um, a lot of calcium carbonate minerals that then solidify these, these sedimentary bodies. Um, they then turn bones into, into fossils, so on and so forth. And we get complete skeletons coming out of the ground. So uh, some of the most um, probably significant right now are the Littlefoot skeleton coming out of Sturkfontein member two, which is potentially um, as old as, as three million years. Um, you know, we, we both know um, the research teams involved in that. We also have Australopithecus sediba at about 1.97, 1.95 million years, um, which, is, which is complete. We also have Rising Star, um, which are, are fragmented remains, but there are enough of them to sort of create composites of, of that uh, skeleton uh, for Homo naledi, which is represented there uh, at around 300,000 years. So, um, you know, unlike East Africa, where we, you know, they're dealing in these sort of sedimentary beds that are that are bounded by um, uh, tough units that that they date. Uh, a lot of their skeletons can be more fragmented than what we find here, and I think that's that's one of the the more important parts of looking into South Africa, particularly in the cave systems in in uh, the cradle, is that we find a lot of articulated remains, so that we can really associate these things um, in a, a sort of um, biological sense and understand the, the sort of form and function of those skeletons. Eric, can I just right, jump? So well, thank you very much. As well, for your, as well yeah, it's really interesting. As well. Um, just with regards to the fact that, um, you know, a lot of the uh, Stone Age sites and especially in the cradle as well, Carrie, you've spoken to the preservation of hominin remains, but what we also have is an incredible amount of paleofauna uh, that is preserved as well. And I think that's very important to mention because it gives you a very, a uh, kind of um, good idea about what the paleo landscape was like in the past. We can look at certain ungulate species, look at the predators, and essentially work out, um, you know, how a dry or moist the environment was as well. Oh, that's a whole other kind of specialty, but you can look at the types of animals that are represented and get an idea of what the paleo landscapes were like. Obviously, within the cradle, we have much better preservation of the fauna. And if you look at, say, um, the Val River Basin sites, things like fauna are not as well represented. But I think, um, you know, collectively across the sites, this fauna is very informative and that information can then get fed into wider landscape-based models that then look at, you know, paleoclimate uh, changes, uh, paleoenvironmental changes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. I, I just want to add in before we, we wrap up, but is that landscape, are we, think, are we talking, going back to the question about the sort of misconception of what archaeology is down here, if you just look at that landscape by itself, it has an incredible amount of heritage layers there. From what you've discussed, the really early stuff, the, the fauna, the hominins, but then you also have early farmer settlements coming in there. Brudestrum, for example, is one of the earlier sites in, in South Africa, um, excavated by Revel Mason and various others. Then there's Jubilee Shelter, uh, along with Cave James, was excavated by Lynn Wadley for her PhD. Those are two later Stone Age sites. And from her work there, she, in some, to some degree, pioneered our use of ethnography to understand later Stone Age sequences. 
very debated, but um, so this, that landscape itself, there's so much going on there in terms of the heritage in the Michalisberg in the cradle. This, it's a fantastic place to explore our, our archaeological sequences. All right, fellas, thank you very much for your informative um, uh, opinions on the matter. Um, it's a great topic, and, and we can probably continue this discussion uh, another time. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll be back Thanks. shortly.